Yes, hi, hi everybody. Hopefully you can all hear me. I'm Colin Wright, the chairman of USPIRE, and I have the pleasure of um, sort of asking uh, Amanda to take us through a wonderful uh, discovery day today, uh, which is all about um, strategic storytelling, something that I personally feel very strongly about. And we'll be touching on the concept of uh, strategic storytelling in mergers and acquisitions shortly. But, but firstly, just to introduce you, Spire, we have a bit of background noise there. If I can ask people to mute, that would be uh, great. It looks like we've got music uh, banging away. So uh, that, was, that, was, that was nice to hear. Um, if anybody has got anything by uh, jazz artists, that would be much, uh, much preferred. Um, but uh, we've got, with you, Spire, we believe in sort of making a difference for leaders. And we have three key products within our portfolio, which is our consulting services, uh, where we help organizations to actually drive value through their business. Our academies, where we develop sort of commercial teams on both negotiating and sales. And the network, which is an important part of our offer, where we actually also bring in keynote speakers, similar to sort of today's event, but also look at one-to-one -one coaching and development in a peer-to-peer -peer environment. We have wonderful testimonials from our partners. They talk about how Uspire has changed their lives, created greater returns for their companies and helped them personally to achieve their goals and ambitions. Our blue chip, blue chip brands include organizations like Birdside, Woods Life Sciences, LD, Taylors of Arrogate, Mars, and as well as working with lots and lots of, of smaller organizations, we are passionate about ma making leaders better tomorrow than they were today. Um, and as you can see, that's the, the, the concept of the network where we have our speakers, we look to develop and improve people's leadership skills, decision making, security and tenure and well-being. It's all, all about creating balance and we try and ensure that we make you more effective as a leader and increase your awareness. So thank you for listening. I'm now going to hand you over to Amanda. Really looking forward to Amanda's session. She's a fantastic speaker within our business. And this should be a very exciting moment talking about strategic storytelling. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks, Colin. Hi, everybody. So 16 years ago, I was single and I was living my own. And I had just come back from Ireland where I'd been for four years working for United Biscuits. And I also had just become a consultant and one night I was sitting there at 11 o'clock at night thinking, I need to find a partner. I want to have some children. And uh, this is not going to do it for me sitting here on my own in my rented house in Wokingham. So I got online and I put a profile up on, a, on Dating Direct. My mother thought I was mad and I was going to meet a nutter. Uh, I didn't meet another. He's next door, probably listening. And um, yeah, on my profile, I put, I wrote a little story. And I wrote a little story about where I was at and what I like and so on. And I put things like I like drum and bass and guitar music. My husband's a drummer, that works. I also put that I'd cried when the, it was the very day that the whale came up, in, in the UK, a whale came right into London and swam up the Thames and unfortunately died. And it was really, really sad and I cried. And then the other thing that I put was that my favorite film was this guy here, Shrek. And I'm gonna tell you a potted history of the story of Shrek now. I'm gonna do that to describe storytelling at its absolute simplest best. Um, Shrek, like all Disney films, follows the hero's journey. Many, many books do, and probably nearly every American film that you see, and certainly ones that have a happy ending, follow something called the hero's journey. I'm gonna describe the story of Shrek now using the hero's journey. Okay. So, I don't know whether anybody's heard, this, heard or seen Shrek the movie, but basically Shrek is a troll, he's green and he's a troll. And he's very, very happy, he lives in a swamp on his own, and he's very, very happy in his current reality, eating slugs and having a nice time on his own. When suddenly, one day, a little change happened for him, and a donkey, cleverly disguised as Eddie Murphy, turned up 
and the donkey disrupts his whole life. Not only does the donkey disrupt his whole life, but also a load of fairy tale characters come and they disrupt his whole life. And they tell him that they're under threat and they're all going to be killed by this guy called Lord Farquhar, who's in the castle on the hill and he's the baddie. So what's threat going to do? Well, um, in order to get back to his slugs and in order to regain his peace of mind, he has to go on a quest. And he goes from what we call in the hero's journey, the known world, swamp, on his own, happy eating slugs, to an unknown world. And he goes on a quest with the donkey in the unknown world. And for those of you who've seen the film, and if you haven't, I would thoroughly recommend that you do. He goes on a quest into the unknown. He gets lots and lots of excitement. There's a dragon involved. There's possible certain death involved. Um, there's a love interest involved. And there is a princess, of course, to be found. The princess is the Lord Farquhar at the time. And he goes through a, a whole struggle in the unknown world. And then he finally comes back. And uh, if you haven't seen it, please watch it because the dragon becomes the love interest of the donkey. And Shrek um, becomes the love interest of the princess who, lo and behold, who would have thought it, was a troll too. So, and they're happy ever after, the ever since, well, I always do that the wrong way, ever since then, new reality is that Shrek and Fiona the troll live happily ever after married in the swamp with the fairy tale characters. That is the essence of strategic storytelling. So today we are going to talk you, we are going to talk you through two methods of strategic storytelling. We're going to share the hero's journey by describing to you um, a number of people's journeys in their own words. We've got five guests who are going to be with us. And we are going to challenge you. I've got mm. one challenge for you. And here it is. The art of leadership. The art of leadership is about making your company's story come true. They say that leaders, the only job that you have as a leader or as a manager in your organization is to tell the right story so people believe them. So my challenge to you today, as we go through this next couple of hours, is to ask yourself, is there a story? I'm on tippy toes here. Is there a story that will help you to deliver your strategy? So, what actually is it all about storytelling? And what is the psychology of storytelling? And what makes it such a brilliant thing to use in business? Well, don't listen to me. Um, let's listen to Chester, a clip from um, the BBC that describes why it's so There's important. a Native American proverb that says, the one who tells the story rules the world. Stories have the potential to be incredibly powerful. They're able to change how we relate to each other, to change prejudice. So the potential for stories to persuade is staggering. I read this really, really good research paper about these two books, which basically suggested that if you get people to read a couple of chapters of Harry Potter, they'll rate themselves higher than other people in their ability to potentially move something just using the power of their mind. The people who read about the vampires, they will actually believe that their teeth are slightly longer than other people in the population, just as a result of having read a chapter or two of this book. In terms of psychology, there's a few things that stories actually do to us. We get this sense that we're fully immersed in the world that we're reading about. Would you like to come on an adventure? And we start to almost feel as if the things that are happening to them are happening to us. Thanks, Jester. Thank you. So, 
that particular clip used this quote, didn't it? North American, Native American proverb. The one who tells a story rules the word world. So how are we going to go about doing it? Amanda, you're muted. Thank you. I don't know how that ends. About three years ago, I read a book. And the book was called Seven Stories Every Salesperson Must Tell. And I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend that you read the book. The guy who wrote the book lived in Australia. And I actually, during lockdown, actually spoke to him on Zoom because I was so taken by this book. The Seven Stories are all absolutely relevant to dealing with clients and customers, but they are also so relevant when we're thinking about get cascading strategy through the business um, to the front line to make sure that it actually happens. Mm -hmm. And today, today, we're going to hear from our guests around four of these seven. The other three, you'll have to get the book to read. And I have told Mike that there might be an Amazon rush because uh, he doesn't keep many on Amazon, which is one of the reasons why I was speaking to him. Personal story, so a story about me. My personal story, for example, that I started with was about um, my experience of online dating and where Shrek, the Shrek story came from. Colleague stories about things that have happened to your work colleagues throughout lockdown, for example, or any time at all. And we will be sh sharing some of those today as well. Company stories, of course. So what is the narrative? What is the story? And how do you want your teams to show up to deliver those so that, you know, your, so that your strategy bursts through the pipe at the end um, towards customers with all the energy and inspiration that you want it to? And then also customer stories. I guess in sales, we've talked about these for years around testimonials, customer testimonials. Well, you know, it's more than, more than that. It's so important to tell stories get some social proof from from customer stories and it's not just about a testimonial that says how good your <clears throat> service or product was so yeah you'll have to you'll you'll have to get the book to get the other three stories so i am um honored moved and deeply deeply proud to introduce our first guest our first guest i met about five years ago when I was networking, actually. And our first guest is um, an, a remarkable woman because she took her personal story and she made it her company story. So I am going to introduce you to, to you the managing director, founding director of a company called My Mood Stars. And I'm going to let her tell her story. Wendy, welcome. Are you here, Wendy? I'm here. Thank you so much. Hi, thank Wendy. You. Thank Hello. you, Amanda. So, what Chester, is, what can you find? Up? Can you find her, Chester? Yes, I'm here. Oh, there she is. Hello. 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 Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. What an introduction. Um, but, but yes, yes, you're you're right. I have um, encompassed my story around my business. Um, which started out in 2018 from being a childminder. One particular little lad stood out from all the other minders. I found him quite fascinating, lovable, adorable, but slightly, no, I can't say it. Can I? Odd? But yes, he was slightly odd. And I wanted to figure out why, why he would scream his head off in the middle of the high street, why he would act inappropriately to his sibling falling down and hurting herself. And he would he would laugh um, how he was particular about everything from the way he held on to the buggy when crossing the road it had to be a certain way. And God forbid if I put a baked bean next to his sausage. 
all hell would let loose. So I found him remarkable and I wanted to do some research on this, on this child. Um, so I, I looked into behavior and um, I looked into all the different um, stages of being on the autism spectrum, learned quite a lot about it. Um, then one day I was with him and his fellow minded children and we were looking through my sewing box. I'd taken all the sharps out, I'd taken all the needles and scissors away and we were having a lot of fun with all the materials and ribbons and threads. And you know what children are like, that it was like a treasure box. They absolutely had a whale of a time. And right at the bottom of the, the sewing box, I found a felt star that I had made years ago. I don't even know why I'd made it. It was just a felt cut out star. And I had a light bulb moment. I thought I can use these, I can use these stars to sew different moods on, different expressions, shy, tired, worried, happy, sad, shocked, all those emotions that I knew that the children were going through on a daily basis, but particularly this little lad, I wanted to help him. So I set about making something called my mood stars, which were just that yellow stars that I shoved, stuffed with that polyester stuff and they had um, expressions on and I put those out to child, my fellow child minders who used them in story sacks and were able to um, make up scenarios to their children with each mood. Um, have you ever felt like this? What happened? Describe when you felt like this. And this, with this little boy, was an absolute... It, it, our relationship rocketed. He was able to communicate through the stars exactly how he was feeling. He was super, super noise sensitive, um, sensory sensitive. And all these things came out just through talking to him, using the mood stars as props. It was incredible. So then my Ofsted inspector came to see me, asked what these stars were. I told him exactly what I've just told you guys. And he said, you should market them. I thought, I'll give it a go, why not? So I did, I marketed them, but there's always a middle bit in a story where there's conflict. And unfortunately, the person who made the mood stars for me, sent me the prototypes, which were adorable, swapped factories halfway through production. And what I got back was what I called my mutant mood stars. They were the wrong shape. They had the wrong expression. They were the wrong color. So what did I do? I sorted the wheat from the chaff because nobody knew what the prototypes looked like, only me. So they couldn't gauge on how awful they were, but I felt so guilty about selling them. I just felt such a fraud because I didn't like, I just didn't like selling them. So what I did is I decided to source my own factories in China. I now have two factories that work for me. They send me a prototype 15% through production. So I know that they haven't changed factories uh, in between sending me the prototypes. So now my mood stars are in over 700 uh, early years settings, schools, homes, nurseries, and more recently, Great Ormond Street Hospital and from the back of Great Ormond Street Hospital, Guy's Hospital in London. Uh, so they are, so, so that's my story from a needle and thread to a very uh, successful emotion resource. Wendy, thank you so much. And thank you for brilliantly describing, brilliantly describing as the hero's journey 
you and your mood stars are the hero. Now, hands up if you want to see the mood stars. Where are they, Wendy? Let's have a look. <gasps> they're here. There they are. Yes, they're, they're there. Absolutely fantastic. And, and just show us what, just, yeah, go on. They'd going. be very jealous if I didn't show. Oh, brilliant. Absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Fantastic. Thank you. So they, um, they're made of um, a fabric that sticks onto the scratchy side of Velcro. Um, children love having them either with the board or without the board. There's a book that comes with them, a workbook with little um, questions for children to answer and a space for them to write and colour in and draw. It makes a lovely diary for parents and carers to look back on over the years. I'm Fantastic. very proud of them. Fantastic. And Wendy and I did a little bit of sales training and uh, benefit selling and value selling recently. And I'm absolutely so proud of the way you described that. And I think it will be only fair to, for you to put the link in, in case any of the 85 people who are on this call would like to maybe buy some of those for their early years, early years settings themselves or for their own children, because um, they're, they're really, really helpful for very young children, aren't they, who I've yes, certainly bought absolutely. several sets. I, yeah. I actually say, Amanda, from nine months to 99 years, because during lockdown, our older generation just put whether they were happy or sad in their window or whether they were worried or frightened and that helped their family communicate with their mums and dads with with their grandparents um just just as a as a cue to let let their families know how they're coping so yes That's brilliant and i've got some oh <laughs> this, now you can't see that properly there you go. I've got some. It's the prototype. So she actually said, you can't show those. They're the bad ones from China. <laughs> um, but this prototype I use sometimes on Zoom when we were thinking during lockdown, thinking about people's um, people's moods, people's moods. Wendy, thank you so much. If anybody's got any questions for Wendy, please ask them in the chat. I'll just very um, I'll just quickly check the chat to see if there are any already any feedback for you, Wendy. And do please ask in the chat and Wendy is going to stick around and answer any questions and listen to some other stories as well. Thank you. Round of applause. Round of applause. Rachel Young is your first customer. Rachel, thank you. There you go, Wendy. You're going to be busy. You're going to be busy. Thank you. You are a <laughs> thank super you, salesperson. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Brilliant. What a great way to start us off. Um, brilliant way. To, I'm so proud of you, Wendy so proud so one of the things that I wanted to say before I introduce our next guest who is also going to tell you a personal and colleague and company story is that one of the things that Wendy described absolutely brilliantly is when she told her story using these stages is that there's quite a bit of head stuff going on quite a bit of thinking a bit of logic so Wendy was concerned about the type of the stars and how many factories and all of those facts and then Mark popped that in the chat the facts and the head stuff however I don't know about you I knew her part I knew her story but as soon as she started the heart of the story and the emotions involved in the story was when I was hooked so when you're thinking about telling your story, make sure that you do have head, but you also have heart. And I'm just going to share one more card with you, which is, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Gallup 12. So the Gallup 12 are a set of questions that are asked by Gallup. They're asked every year. There are and it's, it's huge numbers, something like 30 million people have been asked in the last 10 years. And it's been run again in the last couple of years. And they asked 12 questions of individuals within the workplace around how they're feeling on these questions, which are all around engagement. And uh, at one of Gallup's seminars, they, I remember the, the figure really, really well. They said that 78% of engagement uh, engagement for, for workers is attributable to the leader. 78% of engagement in the workplace 
is attributable to the leader. Which is quite, it's quite stark, isn't it, actually? And when I've shared though, that with teams, sometimes they go, oh, it's not me. It's not me, it's them. Um, and the question that I, um, the, the, the question, the statement, and it's number eight statement, and it's not actually the first, first um, the, most, the most used statement, but one of the statements is this. I've got no connection with you there. The I've mission, got no connection. The mission and purpose of my company makes me feel like my work matters. The mission and purpose of my company makes me feel like my work matters. And I don't know about you, but when I feel like my work matters, I'm more likely to achieve the objectives and strategy of my business. And mission, for mission, read story. For mission, read story. So I'm now going to introduce my next guest. And my next guest I've been working with for about 18 months now. Um, she's one of my client, our clients at, uh, at Uspire. And um, this lady has been working. Oh, here she is. This lady has been working. You've got all, you, I can, they can see you now while I'm picking you up. <laughs> this lady has been working tires, tirelessly for the last 12 months to launch within Muller Milk and Ingredients um, their very first inclusion dimension, which is around gender. And Cara is leading that project um, with Muller, and she is here to tell us her hero's journey. Thanks, Amanda. So thank you for having me today. Um, I suppose it started almost two years ago now. Um, it feels much shorter than that. Muller and the dairy industry in the whole in the UK is very male-orientated. And if you picture back to pre-COVID times when we had the the water cooler chats or the corridor chats, whatever we may think of them, we started realising, I say we, it was a group of eight of us, that we're having similar conversations between each other about our careers, our ambition, where we wanted to go with him, Muller, and also that recognition that when we looked at the board or the more senior level positions, there was only one woman on the, the board who was the HR director. So we kind of were saying, we want to make a difference. If we want to have an amazing career Muller, we're going to have to take something and do something about this. So roll on a few months, but there was kind of the background chats, what we're going to do, getting a plan in place. We then recognise we need to start putting this bit together a bit more formally and approaching the board and senior stakeholders and the business to say, we want to make a difference and we want to make a change. We want to create opportunities, but we want to do it in a positive way. This wasn't about slagging the business off or anything like that. This was generally about how do we make this an even better place to work. So we met with the board um, and some senior stakeholders and we took them through why we wanted that change. We recognised as we were doing it that one of the key parts of it was we had to remain authentic. When we work in a business that's nearly 10,000 employees in the UK across all business forums, we recognised that we couldn't go with this as almost being seen as a tick box Miller exercise. It really had to come from the forefront of the employees on the ground and demonstrate why this is really important. As with any businesses, usually the first question you get from your board is, well, why, what's the business reason for us to do this? So when we approach this, a lot of us are in the commercial department, so you're speaking to customers, we kind of put a business case together of this is the reason why, this is the so what. And we stated our ambition as a group and then we attached it back to what were the business benefits to get that real hook there. Now instantly our board, we're on, we're on board um, and they recognised the importance of this, not just for the business so what, but also for the culture of the business and where we want to progress to overall. Um, Rob Hutchison, who's our CFO, sorry, COO, he is one of our sponsors um, in the steering group and he really kind of spearheads us from that level down and really starts to help the communications, he sponsors events, etc. as well. So we had this great grounding from our, our board team and part of that was they were including investment. They were, they were happy to put some money behind it, which as many of you know in the business, Business, if you put the money behind it, you know you have got that back and it's not just a, yes, okay, you're fine to go. But what we realised was it wasn't going to happen overnight. This wasn't something we could quickly put in place and make the impact we wanted. 
it was very much baby steps to start. And probably one of the things we did recognise very early on, because this wasn't our normal day job, we had our day jobs to do also, and a lot of us are in senior positions, we needed help and we needed volunteers. So we quickly asked and reached out to the business um, and created out two different groups. We have our steering co, which is made up of mainly board or head of business unit members, and men and women, who are there to really sponsor it and make sure that the support's there and the message gets carried throughout the business. And then we have what we call our action group, which is made up of, of we've got about 20 people on that now, and um, from all different parts from manufacturing, from our technical teams, from our agricultural teams, to really gain support and drive, drive the momentum through all the different communities that we have. It has taken an awful lot of work and focus and time, and um, probably more than we realised, but the difference that we've made, it makes it really important. Um, one of the points we did then recognise when we started gaining momentum around 12 months ago was we need some help. Uh, and we realised that as much as passion and drive we get is there, we need somebody just to keep us on the straight and narrow and really make sure we're clear on what we want to do. And that's when Amanda stepped in, um, who's literally been the glue that keeps us connected and keeps us on the right path. And the benefit as well was when we were going to the more senior meetings or trying to get additional funding or put events in place, having that outside voice allowed the message to land a lot clearer and also manage some of the difficult conversations where you may have stakeholders who didn't quite get why we needed to do what we're doing. And um, so fast forward the last 12 months and we are in an amazing position. I'm so proud of what we've achieved, especially through COVID. We have had four big events, including external speakers. We have had coffee mornings. Um, but I think the thing that's made me so proud of what we've achieved is we've talked about subjects that 12 months ago, nobody in this business would even consider. Probably the biggest call out there in menopause. We had an event in menopause um, for menopause month in October. And part of that was some breakout groups. And we actually had a lady on there who was in a place that she was ready to resign. She didn't think she could do the job anymore because of the symptoms she was having with menopause. And just by encouraging the open conversations, she's now in a much better place where she's been able to get the support that she needs. And luckily we're not losing a fantastic member of her business um, through doing that. So that really stands out. And then I think from a personal point of view, what I've really recognised um, through myself, where I'm, I'm quite outgoing and I'm probably not scared to have an argument, I tend to back down if I think oh, it's probably a bit too much hassle. I've had some stuff with my daughter. I have a teenage daughter who's almost 16 and she's been having a tough time in school and unfortunately her school is not the most inclusive. But what I've done is I've faced into the conversations. But I've done it in a positive intent. It's not just about being an agon mum. It's about demonstrating and sharing what we have learned through Emily Muller with my daughter's school, with her headmistress, to demonstrate why it's really important, not just for the girls, but also the boys to educate them. And I think when I get to the end of the year um, and kind of look, look at what we're doing for next year, we have a platform of events we're really looking forward to. Um, we've still got some challenges there. There's still some conflict we need to override, but we have a plan and we have some great people behind us. And I think it's just amazing that we are on the very start of our inclusion journey and there's only better to come um, going forward. So thank you very much for allowing me to share my story. Thank you, Cara. Thank you, thank you. Now, I've been involved in that story, um, but I, I have to admit it's one of the most proud, one of, one, of the, one of the most rewarding projects that I've been involved in. And that's all down to you and those knocking on, knocking on 40 people from board level right down to the factory, factory floor who are busy um, getting lorries to deliver our milk and cream this Christmas. Um, and uh, I'm doing a pretty good job of it, I think. Um, listen, I've got a question for you. One of the, um, and it's, it's quite handy having this behind me, isn't it? Um, one of the chain, one of the struggles that I think you, that, that we've had is how to, um, how to get the message down through the business. So when we talk about a strategic story, you know, at leadership level, yeah, Usually, hopefully, we're pretty clear when we're in a boardroom or we're in a, at a senior leadership team level about what needs to be done. 
And then as the story trickles and cascades through, um, you know, if it's not brilliantly told in the way you've told that one, but brilliantly told, sometimes it, it gets lost and not everybody hears the story. And as a result of that, not everybody could take the action that we want to take. And um, at Muller, one of the struggles we've had is being able to do that, isn't it? Get the um, message through to everybody, not just the people who could turn up to our teams or be involved in an event that is at the moment online. Although we're hoping to change that. What, what, how, what's, how's that struggle been, and uh, how do you think we might uh, resolve it? I think the the biggest struggle we have um, is, like you said, we have so much of our core employees are on the front line, which means often they're out driving lorries, they're on production lines. Of different chefs. Also, a key part is English isn't necessarily always their first language, and they don't have access to a lot of social media, digital, etc. As well, it, it goes back to the point about being authentic and ensuring this doesn't look like a tick box business exercise. And what we've done is it is about getting that personal story out there and really supporting what we're doing, having clear objectives. So when we have any events or we start kind of discussing topics we have takeaways of what we'd like them to do. And then we have different guest speakers come in and they're both internal and external. And what that's now done is we have people opening up that have generally came and said to us, if it wasn't for Women and Muller, we would not be having these conversations internally. And I think it's encouraging that feedback and the conversations. It's not about us telling all the stories, it's about getting as many people as possible, but keeping it genuine to what you're talking about and not being overly structured with it I think is a key bit as well. Yeah fantastic fantastic and uh, it's also fair to say that what we're going to make sure that um, the budget for next year gets right down to site level so I think you were uh, you and the action group the 20 people in the action group are going to be busy going to some sites um, hoping that we're able to do that next year which is fantastic thank you. And I'd just like to also send out a thanks because I know that Rachel Young is here. Rachel is, um, um, has been instrumental in Nomad Foods in the, um, what is called, I think it's called Women in Nomad, WIN rather than WIM, Women in Nomad, who get, has given us more than at least three times, has given us her time to help. And there you go. Thank you, Rachel, to, to help and direct us and supporters in bringing, um, you know, in, in being the allies in more than um, just her business. So uh, that's a big shout out to you, Rachel. And uh, thanks for being here. And for buying some mood stores. Cara, thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, one of the things that it is sometimes quite tricky to do when you are thinking about what story, what is the narrative that you need to get through to your team members is to be able to communicate it. And, you know, there's a, there's a structure here that, that I talked about. Um, but one of the things that we've started doing is thinking about how you visualise it. And at our last uh, live event, which was all the way back in 2019, got another one coming up now in February. So we are going live again. You'll get a bit few more details about that later. Um, in our last event, we used what we call a visual storyteller, and we found it so useful to be able to do that. Um, and I think um, certainly we've we've worked with Fran with some other clients as well since. And um, Fran O'Hara is the managing director and founder, as she is, managing director and founder of Scarlet Design. And um, not only is she an amazing visual storyteller, and has got some help for us in terms of how to do it. But she's also got an amazing story of how she has pivoted her business as a result of, well, what's been happening in the last couple of years. Fran, over to you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, lovely to be here today. I'm just going to um, talk through um, one aspect of what happened with us. And I'm going to use a template that I know that, that we created with um, Amanda that we're going to share with you as well. So I'm just going to kind of model it really, because that's what we do a lot of processes. So hopefully you'll go away with a tool as well. Well, a few tools hopefully on today. So um, I'm going to go from there. I'm just going to change my screen now so that I can share my screen here. Ooh. There we go. 
can you can you give me access to screen a participant screen sharing? Do you think, Amanda? Is that okay? I can. Yeah. You absolutely. probably have to make me a co-host, you. Yeah, I think I do. I'll do that now. Okay. So just a one second bit about my background. So we've got a design company. We, we're a very values-based business. We do a lot of stuff with health and social care, but we also work with corporates and we donate a certain amount of our time to um, creating visual tools that help people tell their messages. Um, and then my big background is that um, I worked for Disney for four years. So that whole aspect of visual storytelling, and we were part of the marketing and business department, was really strong about using colour, engaging, you know, really thinking about the visual so that uh, it's, the, the stats are something like 85 to 90% of people prefer seeing information in a visual format. So if you're at least, even if you're putting clip art photos or whatever you've done, if you've put that in your slide, you've got a little bit more engagement. How's that going? Oh, there we go. Yep. Fantastic. So um, I'm going to talk about Zoom fatigue, which I'm sure hopefully you won't get today. So I'm going to whiz through the slides so you don't get through too much uh, Zoom fatigue. Everybody see that okay? Is that okay, Amanda, from your side? Yeah, yeah looking, looking great, looking great. Okay, great, lovely. So um, just checking I can do this one okay. Okay. Have a good day. Okay. We've got somebody. Did you realize is it what you said? Somebody's not on mute. Okay, yeah. I'm going to keep going as, as we yes, do. Okay. This is a Zoom, a typical Zoom thing, isn't yeah. it? Okay, so I'm going to talk about our Zoom fatigue uh, story. So this is the template that um, Amanda uh, that we created together, and I'm basically filled that in for myself. We've created an interactive version of you. You can type it in there because we know it's sort of quite nice sometimes to write into things. But if you want to use post-its, that's something I do a lot with people. So I've basically put my story into the template, and these headings give you. Um, the different sections and then they go to make three main board sections, which is the, the known world where you start and then you go into some kind of change, conflict, struggle, conflict resolution, which is the unknown world. And we, we call that the uncomfortable zone as well, because you're feeling a bit uncomfortable, but you've got to keep going. And then there's the new reality, which is back to your known world. And that basically is a, it's a very light version of what happened to us over the pandemic. So, yes. So um, how creating one digital visual map during the pandemic changed Scarlet Design's core business focus and generated more resilient income streams. Um, and then really the aim for, for my story, or if I was telling this to you without the obviously the, the prompt along the bottom, you know, so you can see where, where which section it is, is that we really want to show you that uh, remote working has presented us with a range of business opportunities as people are experiencing this overload. Um, and meeting and stream screen fatigue, and they just need more visual tools to engage and communicate. And we just wanted to be more visible and just share with people what we do. So um, as, uh, as Amanda said, here's one of the visual minutes from that session we did. And you can see they're pretty big. They're, you know, I've got the board up behind me as well. So it can be anything up to three, four meters wide, one meter high, we draw it live. It's a great engagement thing, it's part of an event. So that was kind of our core business. We do lots of other things, but that was the thing where we got to stand up in front of hundreds of people. So basically, we didn't have to do much marketing. We would create the tools from this, cut it down afterwards into a, a clip art collection. If they wanted it, we would share it on social media. So pretty much we knew that on a regular basis, we also facilitate that we would be up in front of people. So they were our main marketing uh, platform. Um, and as we're a visual storyteller, so 50% of our own came, came from this sort of area. Um, and then one day this happened, late February 2019, the pandemic came. We moved our offices homes. Um, our events, you know, all the events were cancelled or they were postponed to July and then they carried, moved on. Um, the business lost thousands of pounds of worth of income because, we, you know, March was our busiest month. I think we lost £8,000 in a week. And we're not a big business, um, but also the longevity that we'd always have, the sustainability of our main visibility, marketing and network opportunities just, just went overnight. Um, we already work digitally because we are a design company. So we just invested a lot of money in more iPads and kits so that we could um, uh, do digital visualizing. Um, and then I also went on a lot of courses on with the IAF for, to facilitate, to learn more programs, set up WhatsApp groups with other um, peers so that we could all give each other top tips and stuff. And then I did one with a lady in Denmark and it was three nights, five till seven. 
And I thought, that's not much, is it? But I tell you, by the end of those three weeks on top of work, I physically just couldn't understand. I felt tired. My head was hurting. So I Googled it after I saw a LinkedIn article in Harvard that there was a thing called Zoom fatigue. And I thought, oh, thank God for that. It's not me. So I did a lot of research around it and um, found it very helpful. Uh, and then because of that, um, I decided to practice Procreate on my iPad, a new program that I was learning. And I thought I'll create a visual inco incorporating all of this disinformation that I'd, heard, uh, that I'd found. And then I thought, you know what, we'll put it on our website as an open source tool, which we do a lot of anyway, to help others. Because I knew that so many other people were sort of experiencing the same thing. Um, so that people could download it and we put it across all of our comms platforms and it went viral. Thousands of people shared it and we had and we still have a huge uh, response to it because obviously, you know, we're still in that world now, aren't we? So at regular intervals, we tweet it or our clients tweet it or whatever. Um, and then people told us how they were using it, which is really rewarding, like Pembrokeshire County Council put it in their staff newsletter health organisations sent it out to people. A lot of people show it, either they send it out with a meeting invite or they show it before the meeting. And it's just really a nice way of saying self-care and you know, you've got to do what you've got to do to stay in that meeting zone. And then even weirdly, I was doing another um, course online and um, I was sort of mentioning about this and a lady in Canada said, I saw that yesterday. And I thought that is surreal. <laughs> You're in Canada and this visual that I did has popped up in Canada. So it's like many things with marketing, isn't it? You, you don't know where it is. You have to tell your story or share a tool that tells your story. Um, and then it's going to do its job. So I think that's all you can do really is tell the story in the best way that you can. So we had this visual that we'd done and then people were sharing it. You know, leaders like Helen Bevan, she shared it and that's had 642 likes 300 and something retweets people have commented on it saying how much they use it so you know we've been lucky that we've had feedback as well so we've learned a lot about the kind of visuals that that people want to use um and we've had people sharing it so it's you know it's been quite it, it's sort of helped us make sense of the pandemic in lots of ways so um, as a result of that, um, we got it's raised our profile. We've been we, we've always done a, quite a lot of plan on a page, but now we do a lot more plan on a page in the digital and non-digital work areas because obviously things have sort of come back in. And these have resulted in of this area of work becoming a core business, which is you know fantastic for us. So a workshop and then a plan on a page like this sort of thing. Um, nine months later, Powys Council Digital said, could you do a Teams one? Because we know a lot of public sector organisations and companies can use Teams. So we did another one of those. And then that also went viral. So now we sort of we post both of them up there. Um, uh, and then also through the visibility and these kind of tools, um, we've just uh, we've just nearly a year into now a 12 month company's house sketch notes and visual thinking course. And the aim of that is to create a more visual led culture. So we, we show visuals like this and you know lots of other things, but it sort of, it, it made them go, do you know what? Okay, we're gonna have to do something because they have no plans to go back company's house. And they were data people and PowerPoint people. And she said, we are getting so much. So having this kind of evidence and all the reference groups, things that go with it was really helpful for them. So that has been a big piece of work for us to work with Companies House to help them find ways that their teams who are working at home can manage the fatigue. So the hand-drawn sketch notes has been a big thing for us. And we've run the same course four times. So we've learned a lot from that. And then since then, to keep our profile raised, as I said, we could just keep sharing the visuals. And then quite soon after that, I did um, another visual called computer text and neck exercises because I was sort of hovering over my iPad in a very non ergonomic way. Um, uh, and I was just I could feel myself sort of just basically crunching up. So I did some um, research on that. And that's another one that a lot of people are, are doing the same thing. You either sat in the same position or you're leant over. And then we've always done a few sort of few visuals. So um, we did some we do, every now and again now at regular intervals, we do uh, visuals which we share to people, which keeps the recognition up. But also it's a tool for people that we put on the, the website. So as a result, our income is returning to pre pandemic levels. We're much more resilient with a strong digitally based core offer in addition to all the live events 
the, the, the drawing, the training and the branding work, because we also accidentally, as part of this process, designed the logo for the, um, the Dragon's Heart Hospital in Cardiff, which was another thing that raised the profile. So we sort of threw all these different elements. Um, you know, we've come out of the pain, we're not come out of it because we haven't, but we are now in a much more resilient space because we did the visual, which raised our profile. And then we just learned and built on that learning for our marketing, really. So that is kind of the story. If anybody wants to use the visuals that are in here, they're all on our website, scarletdesign.com. You know, they're there for everybody to use in any way that you want to. So that's it, really. That's my story. And hopefully I've kept under my time for you. Thank you, Fran. Fantastic. Now, fantastic. Thank you, Fran. And yet yeah, Fran has made our, my, kind of my one, look much more, much more easy to Prettier. use and made it and made it interactive as well so it's an editable pdf it's our gift to you go please go and use it and um, from before you go though dragon's heart now um that is an amazing story in itself so if you can tell us that in three minutes we are, i would absolutely love to share that with the team so tell us what what you mean by because some people we've got people here from all over the world will have no idea what you mean OK, um, it's a shame I haven't got the visual up now. I'll, um, so the Dragon's Heart Hospital was our Car uh, Wales's Cardiff's um, Health Board's version of the Nightingale Hospitals. We, like I said, we'd always, we work a lot with the Health Board and I was watching telly, well, on Twitter it was, and I saw the Chief Executive and the Head of OD walking on, you know, our really famous rugby pitch. And I thought, what on earth is happening there? <laughs> Why are they on that pitch? And then they said, we're going to turn it into a field hospital. This was very early on. So I just tweeted to them on any health boards. I said, if anybody needs anything, because the other thing I'd seen was the emergency pathways where people, they were, you know, they were saying, we've just had huge meetings about how we're going to get people in and get them through. And we designed pathways. So I just said, anybody want any help? You know, we're here to help you. Um, and so didn't hear anything, but did other things for the people. And then I... Um, I saw them up again and I just tweeted to her directly and I said look if you need any help and I was cooking tea that night for my daughter and she just sent a message saying we would like the logo for the Dragon's Heart Hospital we're calling it the Dragon's Heart Hospital um uh, and we'd also like the signage and I was like okay <laughs> so I'm gonna put the gonna put the spatula down so I spent a day um created a series of concepts from very health boardy to quite emotional uh, dragon's heart with a lot more heart in them and they voted all the contractors building the hospital voted all the staff everybody involved in the project uh, and then they picked number five which was this heart with a dragon I'll find it in, in a minute um, so a, a very evocative visual story that they were that they were going to tell and I thought that was very brave because it wasn't too health boardy and what happened it again it was another one of those things that they posted on Facebook and Twitter and said we're calling it this here's the logo and there was this huge outpouring of emotion in Wales online about the pride in having a hospital that was called Dragon's Heart um, and it, it really sort of gave people a boost it was sort of we felt like we could do it I think I definitely there was some brand leveraging, I think, of them on the rugby stadium because the WRU and the Principality Stadium helped. So I think it was that sort of passion of people going, right, we're going to do it our way in Wales. We're going to call it the Dragon's Heart. We're going to base it on a myth. And then they had this logo, which was sort of very evocative of a, a dragon cu um, curling around a heart, which is the least thing you can imagine normally from a, you know, from a health board logo, which is normally in Wales, it's a Celtic cross with a nice bit of uh, Frutiger next to it, Frutiger font. So, so yeah, and that, that mm. doing the values-based work, like you said, it helped us make sense of the pandemic, that we could actually do something that was useful for people. And it, I found it fantastically embarrassing that people kept saying, well done on the logo, because people are going into work. You know, I knew a lot of the health teams there you know, it, I was like, no, no, we just did our job. We did a logo, but, you know, obviously proud that we could do that. So that's why I say we accidentally designed a logo for a giant hospital. I just kept thinking it's going to be four metres high as I was uh, as I was designing it, which is where you should always think about with your stories. Where are they going to be seen? Where are they going to be told? So, yes. Fantastic. The... Listen, Fran, thank you for sharing that particular story, because whilst I didn't tell you that one of the other seven stories in Mike Adams' seven stories we should all tell, is actually a values story. And Fran created that logo completely free of charge um, on a voluntary basis and all the work that then came after it um, with the Dragon's Heart uh, Hospital to keep the, the COVID sufferers of Wales safe. 
So thank you so much for that. Shall I show the logo it. super quickly? Because I feel yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you got it? Where's, got where's it? the Love visual you. aid? You're thinking to yourself as she's rabbiting Love you. on. Love to. And there we go. Drop that into the chat for everybody as well. Yeah, there, there it go. is. So there as you can is. see, the right hand bit of it is completely on brand for the for the NHS, and then the left hand bit is this quite surreal dragon with a heart which people just love and then we also did a gif with a rainbow heart on it so picking up on that nhs theme and they that's the thing they love most even the kitchen used this in the, in the hospital as their logo the staff mm -hmm. it really gave them a boost it gave them an identity when they were building the hospital she said that was the biggest thing was that they had a story and suddenly they knew who they were they weren't yeah. people running around a large stadium trying yeah. to find their way out as often happens yeah. with a, a large stadium so anyway, enough thank about you. me brilliant fantastic thank you so much Pleasure. so we have heard from wendy her personal story about my mood stars which has become her company we've heard from cara who got together with some colleagues and described how she and her colleagues have created and started to that huge trojan horse of uh, gender in terms of uh, bringing um, inclusivity um, higher up the agenda in her company and then fran thank you so much for the work that you've just done um, and also for that template, which is a real gold dust, I have to say, is real gold dust. So please take it. Af we're going to have a break in a moment. After the break, we have yet to hear from um, WH Smith, who are a in the in the UK. We used to call them CTN, which stood for confectioner, tobacconist, and news agent. And anybody in that area will know that all three of those categories have struggled in various different ways over the last few years. So Cara is going to tell us her story about how she's used storytelling to, to, to change the approach and the mindset, both internally and with her suppliers. We're also going to hear from Colin, who's our chairman, who's going to talk you through a slightly different version of this, which is actually how we've been helping a business with their mergers and acquisitions strategy. So, you know, gets really down to the whether the, the wheels hit the tarmac in terms of strategic focus. So we need to hold on for that. And then finally, we're going to hear from Sean Smith, who is the sales director at Birdseye, who's going to tell us how he used strategic storytelling. He and his board used strategic storytelling to kind of help a, their business to show up in the best way following um, a number of acquisitions, and I'm going to let him tell you about that. So we're going to see you back here at 10 past two, please. Um, G, um, that's um, GMT. So that will be 10 past two at 2.10. We'll see you then. We will get going. Fantastic. I'm just going to put myself on gallery view so I can see a few. Right, I would like you all, please, if you possibly can, to um, humour me and remove your um, add your videos back in so that I can see some of your faces. Hiya, I can see Paul. Hi, Paul. I can see Andrew now, Maliki. Um, just add your faces back in. Thank you, because I'm just going to ask you a question that requires some visual. OK, hello. Hello, Jason. Hello again, Dave. Let's look on the other, slide, other side. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Marvellous. So my question to you after the break, having heard three stories and with uh, at least three to go, on a scale of, um, it, actually not on a scale of one to ten, if this is yeah, not sure, not sure, this is yeah, I'm getting there and this is I am absolutely going to do this. How are you feeling about telling a story in your business? How are you feeling? Oh, oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, some definite, definite. Good. Thank you. And maybe a couple of yeah, still need to get my head around it. Yeah, I get that. Totally get that. It is a it is some for some businesses. It's a completely different way of um, of leading, actually. Now, and to that to that with that in mind, there is a question that's come in the chat and it's from Julie Lucanay. And Julie, um, if you are around and you want to pop on and ask that question, we're delighted. Just give you a couple of seconds to see if you would like to do that. There's a question here from Julie who worked in supply chain. If not, I will ask it because I've got it here. Oh, I cannot hear. Here. Oh, here she is. Here's Julie. Thank you, Julie. What's your question? 
so my question is, I'm working in the supply chain uh, for ages. And I would say that we can be really very, very great experts in all of the stuff related to technical engineering, specific things, uh, mechanisms, machines, lines, etc. But we are not really uh, professionals in telling or selling the stories. So could you please give, uh, I mean, it would be great to get all of the thoughts from, from all of this audience, very basic and maybe primitive, like a first suggestions and advice. What to avoid, what do I need to do, start doing differently, etc. Fantastic, thank you, Julie. That is an excellent question. So I'm hearing you say that you are in a, you're, you're aiming to help a supply chain team within PepsiCo, I can see, thank you for your background, um, a, a supply chain team to be able to tell the strategic story, be it, I mean, I'm just looking over here, uh, that way, oh no, that way, personal, colleague, potentially, company, um, or customer story. Uh, yeah, yeah exactly. absolutely. Okay, I've got two bits of advice and two recommendations, and then if anybody else has got any, please do, um, We've got a couple of minutes to, uh, to, uh, to hear from a couple of other people and then share in the chat. It's a brilliant opportunity, and thank you for taking it, Julie, to hear from others. There may be others who are managing or certainly involved with uh, functions around supply chain. So what we're talking about is an expert team, yeah? A team of experts who are highly knowledgeable in their area. And we do actually work with some supply chain, te supply chain teams. And one of the things that, that we find is, and it's the same with, with number of expert areas. So in pharmaceuticals, it's the same. In IT, it's the same. I'm currently working with an NHS digital services team around implementing a multi-million pound um, multi-million pound system and they are struggling with this. In fact, I'm going to be working with them next week on storytelling. And that is to to suspend the communication and the influencing that they are doing using knowledge. So we tend, when we're experts, to lead from knowledge and, and potentially give a bit too much detail, a little bit too many facts and a little bit too much data. So it's around suspending that. And then my second piece of, my, so that's what they need to be careful of, not doing. And then my second piece of advice is really simple, get practicing. So use the, for, use the, use the um, template and get people to tell their stories. And this may seem a bit counterintuitive from a team who don't want to use words well and um, may not be quite as um, using, coming from the heart rather than the head is to get them to tell their personal stories first about what they've been doing within um, the last couple of years and then move on to maybe what a colleague's been doing. And then you will start to get to the point where they can, they can think about what are the key elements they want to influence and start to share the story there. And you can tell other people's stories as well, which is really cool. So I hope that helps. Has anybody got Mark? I can see your hand up. Mark, you're on mute. Big tip from me, Julia, and to everyone is start with story. The number of presentations I see that start like this, and please don't do this anymore. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Mark Francis, and my purpose today is. Everyone knows who you are already, so you're just wasting airspace. So be bold enough to start a presentation with, yesterday I was with a multinational team and... So you go straight into story relevant to the theme of the presentation. And that's my recommendation. Be bold and do it right from the start. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. If anybody else has got any tips. Oh, Colin. Yeah, Colin, where you go? Hi, Julia. I think you'll find when we come on to the M&A section and we talk about strategic storytelling, there is a couple of other templates that uh, are very similar to the one that you've already seen that will bring to life how you actually work with an M&A environment. And I think you'll get a few tips on sort of building your own story for supply chain just by looking at a couple of those techniques. Absolutely. And that is coming up very, very soon. So please do add any other recommendations into the chat, um, because now it is time for us to hear from Anna Lloyd. Anna Lloyd is um, unfortunately not with us, um, but she, she and I spoke on Zoom very recently. And Anna Lloyd is the category, category director in the WH Smith Travel. 
And WH Smith are a, for those of you who are not in this country, WH Smith are the ones that you might buy your newspaper, you might buy your magazine, you might buy your water or your snack in any UK airport or train station. They're the ones that you are likely to go into and they sell books and all sorts of other things. And um, Anna has a story to tell, which I'm going to allow her to do. So if we could please move to that video, Jester, then let's see what she's got to say. So Anna, where did you find yourself at WH Smith Travel? Well, yeah, Amanda, as you can imagine, it's been quite an 18 months um, being a travel business. Um, we've been, you know, overly impacted by um, by COVID-19. And, and actually, you know, pre-COVID, we were a business that had been growing for a number of years, uh, making conversations with suppliers, um, you know, actually very positive. And so with quite a young team um, of buyers and, and actually lots of new people who've joined the business over recent times, what we, what we realized is there was a bit of a gap in terms of how they could tell their category stories um, to their suppliers, but also internally so that they could land their plans um, with the different functions within the WH Smith business as well. So what made you train your team in storytelling? Well, I think we've got a bit of a commercial calendar that we have, which we tend to follow each year with the commercial team, which is very much focused on the category plans and the teams being really clear about what their vision is for the customer, for their plans. Now, when I very first joined the business and I started listening to my teams tell their stories, I realized that actually they weren't putting the customer at the front of that plan and really bringing to life what they wanted to do. So that was why I wanted to find a way of equipping them with, with better tools, I suppose, of actually properly telling a story. And as I said, it's important both for suppliers and external as, as it is internally to influence people and to get stuff landed. And actually COVID gave us a great opportunity to bring the customer much more to the heart of our plans. You know, we're a, a business in recovery. We had to put our best foot forward from a proposition perspective. So actually really getting people on board um, to supply us with the best products, um, to invest in brilliant campaigns in our stores and, you know, really help us achieve against our commercial targets was really important. And storytelling just seemed to be the way that we needed to do that, to unlock that within the team. Fantastic. So listen, without giving away the crown jewels, can you give us an example or a couple of examples of how the team have used yes. storytelling? Yeah, well, what's been really cool, actually, is the main thing was about how they could deliver their category plans initially internally. So the teams presented to both myself and our commercial director, Rich. Um, but then also the pinnacle of that was how we then used some of that within our supplier. We had a, a virtual supplier update recently. Um, so we've very much seen the buyers use it within how they tell their story around their category plan. Um, Matt, our tobacco buyer, was really interesting in terms of it just completely changed the way he thought about it in that his vision for tobacco actually didn't talk about tobacco at all. And it talked about, dry, you know, getting to that smoke free um, vision of, of, of 2030. Um, so really a different, just a completely different angle to it. But what's been also really cool is actually we have quite a few um, internal like huddles or um, br broader meetings across the total business. And what I've seen with some of the buyers is when they've been asked to present at these, whether it's updating on October half term performance or the plans for Christmas, is that even in those kind of situations, they've started to use the storytelling techniques. Um, in particular, they've thought about their hook. Um, and that's what we've seen either visually through using a picture or something, or a lot of them have used kind of asking a question to the wider group or something like that to get people engaged and listening to what they're sharing. So it's been so rewarding seeing that in, in not just delivering that category plan, not just in front of suppliers, but also just in that in that broader business context. Fantastic. Fantastic. And uh, what would so what would your advice be? I know you, you're not able to be live with us today, but what would your what would your advice be to uh, leaders thinking about how they plan their strategic narrative? I think the biggest thing for me is about keeping the momentum on this. What's worked really well is that we ran a number of workshops with some different tools and we've used it in in a real life situation. So using our category planning process 
as kind of the purpose of storytelling gave it meant that they had something real to practice with and I think that was you know that was really powerful but now it's about keeping that momentum um, this time of year is often when a lot of joint business plans are agreed with suppliers so I think um, using that on an on ongoing thing and, and giving the teams the opportunities to share what they're doing on a more regular basis uh, I think will be really important because it will keep the focus and the momentum because um, I don't want to lose a lot of this great work and the way that they've changed the way that they're thinking. Ah, oh, that's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant, Anna. And uh, listen, if there are any suppliers of WH Smith or WH Smith Travel listening, then um, go and ask to hear the category stories and, and share yours with them as well. So wishing you absolutely amazing Christmas and, you, um, and all the best for your plans for next year. Thanks so much for, for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oh, brilliant. And, you know, Anna, and I met to do that video just as the Omicron news was coming out on travel. And uh, we did sit for five minutes um, talking about whether we would mention it and we decided not to. So there we go. Fantastic. Listen, um, we're going to, before we hear, we've got two amazing sections coming up, one of which is around how we use, how you Spire use a compelling strategic selling process, uh, storytelling process with uh, mergers and acquisitions at a high level, corporate level. And then from Sean Smith, who is going to tell us how they've used storytelling internally once there was uh, an acquisition um, complete. Before we do that, I'm just going to put you into breakouts. I'm going to ask you a question. And the question is, What are your reflections so far on this thing called strategic storytelling and using stories to get your strategy cascaded right through to the coalface and achieved? And have you got, do you think, yet a story that you might tell? What are your reflections and is there a story that you might tell? Just going to be in a breakout with three others. Please introduce yourselves. You are part of our Use Fire community of leaders and off you go. We'll see you shortly. Welcome back. Right, we're going to have a practice on a um, technique that we've been using in our Zooms, which is called the chat storm. I'm going to give you the instructions first and see if you can do it. Let me tell you, not many can, because it's quite tricky to do this. The first thing we're going to ask you to do is to, I mean, in a minute, I'm going to give you a question. I'm going to ask you to write the answer in chat without pressing send. So without clicking the return button. And then when I say, you'll click the return and then you'll see everybody's answers all at once. OK, and then you can read through them at your leisure. So the question then is, the question is, what is your one main reflection after the session so far? One main reflection. It might be that you've thought of a story. It might be that you need to practice. It might be that this is not going to work for you. It might be that actually think it might. What's your one reflection? So if you pop that in for me and uh, I will just check if you can look, can look up and give me eye contact afterwards, then I will know that you're ready to go. So just as ready, Brigitte's ready, hi Brigitte. Andrew's ready. Lovely, Jane is ready, Philip is ready. Let's check the next two pages. Yeah, ah, uh, yeah, I can see Jane is ready. Okay. So, oh, click the button, there. click the button. Somebody <laughs> went a bit early, click the button. Fantastic, brilliant, brilliant. So you can see um, all those different reflections on where we've got so far, fantastic. Fantastic. Visuals important. Yeah, thinking about the, whether you use a, something as professional as the lovely Franz um, method or use some background visuals or whatever it is that you're going to use. Story holds power. Thank you. Don't use too much heavy data. Make it relatable. Remember that head and heart bit. Be authentic. Fantastic. Fantastic. Brilliant. Please do feel free to read through those. And thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed meeting um, one of our uh, one or two of our community. So we're now going to move on to 
thinking about how we might use strategic story, storytelling in what could be a pretty data heavy situation um, from a corporate level, which is around merger and acquisition. So I'm going to hand over to our chairman, Colin, who's already there by my side. Um, Colin, how do, how do you go about using strategic storytelling in that context? Okay, I'll, I'm about to do that. If somebody can put me on to uh, screen share, then I will actually share a few slides which will help me to uh, talk through this particular session. Um, and uh, that'd be great, thank you. Um, but I'd like to begin that stories are a leader's memory aid. Yeah, They're also instruction manuals and they're also the moral compasses that actually go through the organization. Um, when it comes to m and I'd tell you that most organizations think of mergers and acquisitions as a transaction rather than a process and what we try to do is to coach people to understand that m a is actually a process and at the beginning of any deal is a very compelling strategic story so let me just um share this um with you now One moment. yeah we can see your screen there colin okay thank you we got that. Yeah, all looks good. Good. Okay. So right at the very beginning here, we have what we call the compelling sort of story. And it's a technique we use in m and The thing to also bear in mind is that around about 60% of all sort of acquisitions fail, right? So just anchor that thought. I think a lot of them fail because they don't begin with a very effective story about exactly how two organizations are going to come together. And there's a great quote there from Aristotle that um, it's not about sort of preaching intelligence, it's about actually building an emotional connection, which I think is vitally important in this process. So everything begins here. So if you think about build rapport and trust, no deal ever happens unless you can develop sort of rapport and trust with the other side. The next part of it here is about creating that emotional connection. The emotional connection is discovered by understanding the needs of the other side. And I like to look at acquisitions as like volcanoes, because at any single time they can explode and go wrong. Yeah, that there's a massive eruption, something has happened because you haven't started by understanding the needs of the other side. And I describe those needs as the tectonic plates. So if you want the stability, you have to make sure that you don't move the tectonic plates, which is really understanding those needs and articulating them within your story. The next bit here is is really understanding and building that the story is about is not about you as the acquirer. So a lot of organizations, because they're much bigger than the business they're acquiring, will go in and talk about how fantastic they are. Yeah. The art of actually being able to persuade somebody, and that's what you're trying to do, persuade somebody to sell you their business, is it's always about them. So you have to be allowing them to talk about their organization because that's how you really do create that very strong empathy. When you move around to this sort of partner for the cause, what you're starting to do here is talk about the value that both sides can bring together. Yeah? And it's important at this point to also articulate what you can learn from them. I don't, be I don't believe there's an acquisition that's ever been made where you've not been able to look at the organization providing you approach the whole process with humility and understand that there are things to learn from that particular business. And by recognizing that, it becomes a much more effective process. Then you start to talk to them about how you can help them grow and expand. So you've listened to where the tectonic plates lie, you understand empathy, you've started to listen to their story, and then you're thinking about how you can work together. This is where you build the principle of how you can succeed together. So at this point, you're talking about an effective integration. So how are the two sides going to come together? What is the journey that both, or both companies are going to follow as a result of this acquisition? By the time you get to point six, you will have defined what we describe as obviously quite clearly, you want a deal where one and one always equals three. So you want to make sure that both parties within the story understand how you're going to extract the value that makes it a worthwhile deal. I've seen so many acquisitions where one and one has ended up equaling one and a half. So you've actually lost value within the transaction. When you get to celebrating their success, the important thing here is to think about the legacy. Yeah. 
So you're going to be celebrating success. At the end of this journey, you're going to have something that both of you can actually be proud of as an organization. Let me now share this particular storyline by bringing it to life. And it was interesting that Fran has actually spent some time working at Disney. Um, so I think most of you can recognize the guy with the big ears. Um, but this one here is a guy called Rob Iger. Yeah. Yeah. And Rob Iger, oh, sorry. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, is the CEO of um, Disney. And for 16 years, he set out a vision that said, I want to grow shareholder value whilst retaining the magic. Right. And to do that, he spent around about 100 billion over that 16 years and made 15 acquisitions. But interestingly, during his reign, revenues actually went up by 104%. It's actually quite a remarkable achievement to extract value. Let's think about who we acquired. Well, in 2004, he bought the Muppets. In 2006, he acquired Pixar. In 2009, I think it was, he acquired Marvel. And then in 2012, he actually acquired George Lucas Films, the Star Wars franchises. And in 2019, he did the deal with 21st Century Fox. So that is the 100 billion pounds that was actually spent through this particular organization. Let me now talk to you about another way of looking at strategic storytelling. This is what's known as the Freitag Pyramid. And Freitag was a German novelist uh, around about 1816. I think he died about 1900. But his, his book portrays the sort of the struggles and triumphs of rising middle class. But this process that he created, and it was very similar in the tools that we've been using earlier, is still used today. It's used by authors and it's used by filmmakers because it's a classic way of actually developing a story. So here you've got scene setting. As you move across here, the characters are starting to react to something, which is like a chain of events. Yeah. And I'm going to explain this as we uh, talk about the acquisitions that obviously Disney made and how this came to life, because you can see being in an organization like Disney, how actually storytelling in the Freitag period might have been at the heart of what, what they were thinking about. This is where the story builds, yeah? And this is where the characters start to develop. And then over here, you're creating a crisis. crisis. This is where you've got a complex problem to solve. And that's the heart of any change program through an organization. You're defining a complex problem that needs to be solved. This is where everything reaches a tension point. So you're building up to this climax, often like a battle between good and bad um, or good and evil, as you might find in, in classic films. Amanda articulated the storyline of Shrek earlier, which has very much followed this particular sequence. This is a, a, the area where the plot unravels so everything starts to be understood. And the characters often are changed by the events. Yeah. And down here, you've got the resolution. Yeah. Or it might be the conclusion, or it could be a catastrophe, or it's a positive ending with a lasting memory. So let me actually now talk to you about how that might work with something like the Disney deals that were done. So let's think about the exposition here. So what, what happened here with Disney? Yeah. So you have a situation, let me just get rid of the points I've got on here for you quickly. Let me just talk about how that's come to life with something like Disney. I'm watching a magic show, Colin. It is, oh, yeah. Colin. Colin, just got a couple more minutes, a couple more minutes. Okay, Tell us about very Disney. quickly. So what you've got here is, is if you think about going into Disney, you've got Lucas, George Lucas, he wants to acquire, wants to be acquired. So Iger's going in, he wants to buy Star Wars. So what he does, he talks about Pixar. So in, ex, in his exposition here, he sets the scene by talking about a deal he did, which was Pixar. Yeah? And how he'd left that as a very independent organisation, which was important to George Lucas. When he gets to here, he also understands every single character within the Star Wars or Star Wars sort of organization and, and has understand how those developed over time. When you get to this point, exciting incident, he asked Steve Jobs yeah, to actually speak to George Lucas, the, the Pixar connection. 
and said, if you speak to Steve, I'm sure he will recommend to you selling to Disney, which he did and had a conversation. He then came to rising action. So he met him so many times for dinner, lunch, everything else. And he talked about relaunching the Star Wars ride at Disney to build empathy and asked George Lucas to turn up and actually be part of that. At this point, George Lucas is still indecisive about selling. By the time he gets to crisis, he's saying to George Lucas, you have no family. Who's going to run your legacy? And who's going to grow the brand after you've gone? Yeah, You have no films in the pipeline. So what's actually going to happen with this organization? So by the time we get to this point, climax, you're in a situation where he wants to sell. So George Lucas says, I want to sell. So the inspired moment for Miga is, what I want you to do is to recruit your own creative, is to be a creative assistant, but I also want you to recruit somebody to actually be your successor. And I will employ them as part of this acquisition. Lucas then writes four scripts for further events to do with Star Wars and the Star Wars trilogy, because he was shocked by the crisis element within the discussion. He finally decides to sell, and a lady called Kathleen Kennedy is recruited by Lucas, who then takes over inside the Disney organization to actually run the entire business and look after the legacy. She was famous because of E.T. and Jurassic Park. Yeah? As you move towards the conclusion here and what happened, if you think about it, he's mastered the science of alignment. He's managed to get organizations to come together. He's taken an unwilling seller in George Lucas and persuaded him. George Lucas said that actually Iger and Disney were the only company that he would have ever considered selling to at the end of that process. Um, if you think about the market cap of Disney, they went on to a triple their market capitalization to 302 billion, yeah, which was just below the Alphabet organization, which is obviously Google. So acquisitions are not a transaction. They're not a fight to the death. It's about actually building relationships and developing goodwill. Yeah. And the final point I'd say to you is great storytelling is not show business, it's just good business. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Colin. Fantastic. Thank you. And if you'd like to know more about our use by our strategic, compelling storytelling process, where in terms of merger and acquisitions, you know where we are and you know where Colin is. I'd be absolutely delighted to tell you more. Right, now we listen without further ado. The other side of merger and acquisition not is not, not once that merger or acquisition has actually happened is what do you do then? When you're in a business that is has just acquired, not one, but two businesses, how do you go about telling a story and what do you need to do to be able to make sure that people know how to show up. So I'm going to hand over now to Sean Smith, who is the sales director at Birdseye UK and Ireland, who's going to tell us his story. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about how, uh, how we align three businesses and how aligning three businesses following the acquisition in 2018 of um, Goodfellas Pizza and Aunt Bessie by Noma Foods, how, how that could deliver transformative change to not just the frozen food category in our business, but ultimately employees' careers. But before I do that, let me just paint a quick picture of my own little, my own little story, I suppose, and personal journey. I had to go on in a very, very rapid period of time. So, so imagine, I guess, imagine this. So uh, in January 2018, I was, doing, I was doing the job that I'd always wanted. Uh, I was the commercial director for, um, for this family-owned food, frozen food business called Aunt Bessie's. Um, I led all of the commercial functions, so I led sales, category marketing, uh, and, and MPD. It was, uh, it was a job I loved. I loved the I loved the culture of the business. I was deeply connected to the family values. I lived an hour away from home from work, um, and I had a, a nine-year-old daughter and an expectant, expectant wife. Life was perfect. So, uh, one wet Monday morning, I got the call from the chief executive to uh, to head in to see him and. Uh, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a call to tell me that I needed to further my career elsewhere in the classic sense, but it was one that, to tell me the degree to sell the business to Nomad Foods. Um, and for those who don't know Nomad Foods, they're Europe's biggest uh, frozen food player. And um, they and they'd agreed to sell the business for £210 million. I was then told that was my job for the next few months, along with the rest of the board, to realise the, uh, the sale price. Um, I've never been, never been taught how to do that, so that was a good experience. 
But the biggest personal dilemma was how do I tell my pregnant wife that my perfect little career uh, had been turned a bit upside down? Um, Nomad's head office was four hours away from my home um, and I wasn't going to be a stay away father. Um, and I had, I had quite a lot of preconceptions of Nomad Foods. Um, so um, they were listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So their turnover of 1.5 billion versus our paltry 80 million. Um, it created a number of sort of perceptions that, you know, they'd be a business full of corporate robots obsessed by process. Um, that I'd have to fit into a mold. Um, I wouldn't have much say on how the business was run. And I was worried that my own team wouldn't necessarily fit in and we'd just be told to adopt a culture and a way of working of a classic blue chip. So I had a few niggles to overcome. Fast forward a few months into July 2018, I'm really pleased to say that my experience in that during that period um, proved to me all of those preconceptions were actually wrong. Uh, it's an amazing business. And uh, very quickly, they sold me the story and told me the story, and I believed the story. And I think there's something in that, you know, to, 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 to sell a story, you've got to believe in it yourself. And they offered me the role of sales director uh, across the newly formed business. So um, a business which turned over 600 million at the time. Um, so I was the sales director for um, Aunt Bessie's, Bird's Eye and Goodfellas. Um, I was reassured that my family balance should never be lost um, by my travel commitments. And um, the new board that I joined also made it clear to me um, that we were going to integrate the three businesses by taking the best processes and practices and cultural aspects from each business and melting them into this new culture. And the, the job that I, alongside the rest of the board, were then very quickly asked to do from January 2019 was to bring the best part of five, 600 people on the journey with us and to, 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 to show them and paint the picture of how this newly scaled business, how we could leverage the scale, um, how we could do that in a, in a, in a non-arrogant way how we could create a great culture where people's careers could flourish, but also to sell the story to our customers about how we were going to bring some real growth into the frozen food category and help people realize the potential as well. So, so what did we do? Well, the, there's a whole host of things that we did. And um, for 12 months, it was hard, but it was worthwhile. Um, we redefined the vision uh, for our business. We, we involved people in creating that, that vision. We, we told the story, we painted the picture. Um, at times it was a bit scary because I was new and journey was myself. And at times I, I just questioned to myself, I hope this is, I hope this is gonna be the way it turns out. But that's what we did. We talked about the type of culture we wanted to create in this new organization within a framework of Nomad Foods. We spent a lot of time talking to our people and listening and uh, to alleviate the fears that they had. And we talked to them about how we saw the three businesses coming together and um, together with my new, my new board colleagues, we redesigned the organization structure of three businesses into one operating model. And we spent an incredible amount of time in that first, that first year really about continually reinforcing that with the, the future that we saw for the business. And we also talked to our customers as well about how we saw the future as well, because there was some concern about how this business, all of a sudden, the biggest would become the biggest player in frozen foods by bringing the three businesses together. There was some concern about how we might behave, how we might operate. And uh, we spent a lot of time reassuring them about our vision for, for frozen foods and how we plan to operate and how we plan to operate with personality and integrity. So, what was the result? I've only got five minutes, but um, there was a lot of hard yards. Um, but what it, what it really demonstrated to me was really how by keeping an open mind and creating a compelling vision and that story and bringing people on the journey, it's actually the people who help you sort of write the happy ending. And, you know, we're not finished yet as a business, but it's been without doubt an amazing journey. You know, we we have grown our business from 315 million pounds in 2016 to 700 million pound turnover in the UK, um, as in, in, in 2021. This year alone, we've added half a million new distribution stocking points uh, for our products in the UK. Um, we've heavily invested in our brands. We've grown brand equity and we've helped the UK population fall in love with iconic products such as 
bird's eye potato waffles, bird's eye fish fingers, Aunt Bessie uh, Yorkshire puddings. But more importantly than that, <laughs> we've, we've, we've developed a genuinely people-focused culture and a one business culture where we embrace people being the genuine true selves and people have really begun to progress their careers in the organisation. So for those that bought into the initial story, not only have they had the fulfilment about working within a growing business uh, and all that comes with that, but they've been able to sort of grow both personally and within their careers as well. And I've been part of that. So that's, um, that's my story. And uh, the journey is just beginning, I guess, from our perspective. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you. Sean, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your story. And I'm just looking at looking over here at my personal colleague, company and custom story. You covered all four, which is absolutely brilliant for our last story of the session. So thank you. Thank you so much. The thing that I really love about what you've described is the way you've talked about it being a learning journey and with humility, learning together and sharing stories about how you're feeling about this acquisition, which was pretty big for you. Um, and how you've learned as you've gone through. And um, I'm really proud that you're in your second year of being a Youthspire network member as well. Um, and we're sharing your uh, the journey with us. So thank you so much. I know you're um, like everybody on this call, super, super busy. So thank you, thank you so much. Now, listen, we've reached the end of our session. Um, all that remains for me to say is thank you so, so much to all of our guests, to Wendy, to Anna, who wasn't with us, to Cara, to Sean, and also to Colin for helping us. And I'd absolutely commend storytelling to you. I'm just going to go back to my original question, which was this. Is there a story? that will help you to deliver your strategy. Use the templates, come and speak to us if you need to, and let us know how you get on. Colin, over to you to wrap. You okay? There he is, you're, you're on mute, Colin. Thank you. Still mute. There Hello. you go. You've got it, has it, it yeah. finally unmuted? Yeah, yeah. we're yeah. pressing it got half it. a dozen times. Yeah. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah. You've really lived our values, I was about to say, where you've helped to provoke, energize, and transform. Let's all go and tell some absolutely fantastic stories following today. And I hope you've experienced sort of how we focus on increasing awareness and effectiveness of leaders. Research, research has actually shown that 85% of business leaders acknowledge that they will benefit from peer-to-peer -peer learning, something like you've seen today, and the coaching experience. However, 43% of people never find the time to look, 26% cannot find it when they actually go and look for it, and 21% that finally find it on average achieve significant enhanced results, both personally and professionally. Um, after today, um, you could do one of three things. One is, I uh, hope you've enjoyed today and the experience, and we might never hear from you again. We really hope that won't be the case. The second thing is you can sign up for a coaching session, um, which will be brilliant, and we can talk to you about the benefits from today and explore other opportunities for you to develop your professional skills. And finally, if you just want to find out a little bit more, get in contact with us, and we'll talk about how we help other organisations with various challenges that they have within their business. Um, so the next event we have, uh, which is coming up shortly, is Discover the Power of Your Motivation, uh, which is a brilliant complementary um, sort of exercise that goes along with the colours. So if you've all sat through your red, blue, greens and yellows, um, actually overlaying something about the power of motivation will be uh, greatly enhancing to your awareness. And uh, the other event that it's worthwhile is mentioning is that we have one of our face-to-face -face events coming up which is Uspire Live, uh, where we're actually finally going to get a few people in the room, Omicron permitting, um, where we'll be talking about leading in volatile environments. That's on the 10th of February. We have several speakers on that event. So it is a paid for um, sort of event in London. And as you can see, we'll be looking at VUCA, which is about volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And one of our speakers will be talking about leading the vaccination uh, sort of campaign and setting up large vaccination centers using that very principle. 
So thank you for joining us. Amanda, you've been fantastic. Can we all give Amanda a quick sort of virtual round of applause? And thank you for hosting today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Have a great Christmas.